So good to have you all here. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We like to say we're a community with a cause. It's the cause of dignity and full civil, political, and human rights for all people. Indeed, full rights for the planet itself and all its inhabitants. It's important as we gather to acknowledge that we do so on the traditional land of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Delaware tribes. And we pray that what we do here will honor them and those present among us today. It's been so good to reconnect with Lauren McRail uh, for me. Uh, Lauren and I, we, we remembered uh, earlier today that we first met in uh, 2014 in Bethlehem. Uh, when Terry Doherty and I were there for uh, uh, the fifth anniversary of the Kairos uh, Palestine document and Lauren was uh, working there as a, a mission partner with uh, our, uh, a mission representative I mean, we're working on vocabulary of the United Church of Christ Disciples of Christ and Church of Scotland uh, it's really been a delight to work with you more, most recently too Lauren with the UCC pin uh, if it, Anybody who knows Lauren knows that she's a force of nature. Um, she's a UCC pastor, poet, artist, activist, and she's our friend. Uh, she's been a parish pastor, an English teacher, a hospital chaplain. She stood watch at checkpoints, confronted Israeli soldiers, spent five years working uh, at the w, uh, YWCAA in Palestine. She's taken oral histories of women who survived the Nakba, Nakba and she's made dolls and dressed dolls. She also serves on the steering committee of the UCC Palestine Israel Network, whose 2021 landmark resolution called Israel's oppression of Palestinians apartheid. And that really made it a landmark, a landmark resolution. So Lauren, a welcome to Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and welcome to Fort Wayne. It's wonderful to be here with you. I was asked by Michael to come and tell stories. I said, that's it? You can have me come all the way here to tell stories. He says, well, you have a lot of stories. Um, and so I'm gonna just start with a few to tell you how I ended up in Palestine. I first, um, well, let me say, I've been a long time activist, as many of you are, and when pressed, um, I'll, they'll say, well, how long? I'll say, 1968. And then they go, oh, you're older than I thought. And I go, I was in high school when the Vietnam War happened. I had friends who died. I had friends who went to Canada. And I had friends that went to jail. And how many of you remember 1968? <laughs> okay, I'm talking amongst friends. Um, my mother, who is much more politically conservative than I am, we often wondered, well, she would say, what happened to you? And, and then um, in her later years, she said, you know, you and I are more alike than you think. I'm like, mm, really? <laughs> and she said, we're both shaped by war. And hers was World War II. And she grew up in Macon, Georgia. So I grew up biculturally. Uh, my fi father is from New York, Irish Roman Catholic. And she was Southern Baptist, and I was raised Episcopalian. <laughs> that was the great in-between. And when I was ordained into the United Church of Christ, my aunt kept saying, Who are you again? I said, The Pilgrims. Oh, oh, that's okay. Um, so I, I embody all of that from an early age and, and have become who you see standing here today. But what I'm going to focus on tonight really is about the work I did on behalf of the church as a mission co-worker. Uh, how we do uh, mission work in the field is similar to others. We don't go around uh, evangelizing and converting people anymore. We have a very sad and checkered history as far as I'm concerned about that. Um, a couple years ago when I came back to do my talk about my work, I was taken to a church in Connecticut and shown a graveyard 
um, that uh, had all kinds of Hawaiian children buried there. And I was like, what? How'd they get here? Well, we colonized not only Hawaii, but we also brought the children here to Christianize them. And they were really pleased to introduce me in that history. And I was like, oh my gosh. Um, well, okay, that was back in the day. Uh, we now go and we serve with our partners and we do what the partners needed. So in 2011, I discerned that uh, since I wasn't finding a job in the church and the internet was everywhere, that I would maybe um, take some time away from my search. My mother had just died and I thought she was a traveler and she was an artist. I think she'd be very happy if I went traveling, but I felt I had to do something. So I joined the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel, EAPPI. And I was sent uh, to Bethlehem. It was the Arab Spring. And I uh, didn't go on any delegations like most people normally do to see Jesus did this here and there. And there's the, I just got thrown right into doing human rights work. Uh, I was trained to know the various violations. And the Bethlehem team, uh, we mostly stood at a checkpoint at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, intervening when we could and counting how many people passed, which is somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500. And if the checkpoint closed for any reason, more than 15 minutes, we were to intervene and try to get it open. And, and so this was my introduction to Palestine. Uh, and we also went to home demolitions, often after. Uh, to record for the United Nations what had happened. It was difficult work, but in the midst of all that, people say, well, why did you do this? Why did you go back? I fell in love. I fell in love with Palestine. I fell in love with Palestinians. In spite of the brutal military belligerent occupation, belligerent is the word the United Nations use, um, the struggle so raw, right in front of me, called me. And it does many of us, and those of us who are Christian and or Jewish, this is where our story took place, and also Muslim. The Dome of the Rock is there, one of the holiest sites for, uh, in Islam. And so religious people have come to the Holy Land for many, many years, and I'm one of them. And so I was uh, there for only three months in 2011, but because of that work, when the YWCA of Palestine needed someone to come and do advocacy work with them, they chose me. I was a woman, I could write, I knew a lot about international law and human rights and violations. And, and so that's how I arrived. This uh, slightly bizarre picture of me up here, um, I, we took it because the illegal separation barrier was being um, completed in Beit Jala, which is next to Bethlehem. And once that wall was completed, the Bethlehem area would be completely surrounded by the illegal wall. And so there were protests by all kinds of people, and clergy would go and pray and do things. The day I went, it was the Greek Orthodox <coughs> priests who were there, and, um, and so often I was the only woman in the, the group. And I was contemplating a kind of Rachel Corey thing where I would sort of throw myself around an olive tree and try to risk being bulldozed. And, and then I thought, ah, oh, the church would not like this. It would like me to get hurt, to probably get arrested. Um, well, the least I can do is just show up. And then I realized this bulldozer was behind me. And that's a caterpillar bulldozer. It's on the boycott list for its complicity in bulldozing houses and helping to set up illegal walls. So I asked a colleague journalist of mine to take the picture to get the bulldozer. And because my mother's from the South and a woman doesn't go anywhere without her lipstick on, I thought, if I'm going to be arrested or killed or something, I better put my lipstick on. <laughs> and so if you look carefully, it's only half on because I was like in a hurry. And, and so I sort of like the humor of that. Um, 
And so, so this is uh, often how I, I wore the collar a lot more there than I ever do here. Um, partly to say the church is here, the church is witnessing all of this, and I represent the big C, the big church, not just the UCC. Um, and so, so this is the beginning. This is the name of the exhibit that um, I put together after living there. Um, now, I don't know which button moves me forward. Is it one of these little arrows? Oh, the space bar. So, like many people who have been there before, uh, the wall would talk to me. The wall had messages for me. And as I started uh, to uh, break beautiful Hebron pottery, the cats and I, I had a lot of feral cats that I used to feed, and they would always knock things over. And I didn't want to throw out these beautiful bowls, and so I kept them. And then I thought, you know, I'm in the land of mosaics. Maybe I can make mosaics. Um, and so um, maybe I could do something with the brokenness that I'm seeing. And that's how I fell into my assemblage, collage work. Uh-oh. In 2011, I want to go back. My first main difficult event was the destruction of Siam's house. Uh, the team before me in Bethlehem. So the EEA PPI, let me back up, sends about 30 people every three months um, to Israel and Palestine to be scattered throughout the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. And, and we do various tasks. So one of them is visiting the villages to check on people. Siam's house had been demolished because they built without a permit. Palestinians uh, have to, like here, get a permit to build. The only problem is they never got permits. So they always had to build illegally. Every person I knew had built illegally. And many had demolition orders. And a demolition order could be that they'll come in two months' time, two weeks' time, two hours. You had no idea. So her house was demolished. The Red Cross came and gave her a tent, and she was put in the tent with her family, and she was demoralized. She was traumatized when I saw her. She had three children. Uh, she was a pharmacist. She was an educated woman. She knew also um, some English, which is how we were able to communicate. In the time that I knew her, she became pregnant. And, um, and then all of a sudden I got a call from her. She was at Holy Family Hospital and um, she had lost the baby, a miscarriage, I thought. Just not that that's enough, but it, so I went to visit her and I learned from the doctor that she had carried a baby for two weeks dead and she was completely sepsis at this point and would die unless she had a complete uh, abortion. Now, I used to work as a hospital chaplain in women care, and I knew what to do in the United States. If you don't have money, there's a little pot of money for poor people, and we chaplains knew where to get it, how to find it. And I called the director of the EAPPI, said, Paul, Pauline, this is the situation. She has no money for this, and she will die if she doesn't. And, um, and, and then Pauline swore me to secrecy, which I no longer keep. She said, okay, you're not to tell anyone this. You go and try to find the money. If you don't, you call me back, I have my credit card, and I will take care of this, and we will never talk about this again. Pauline was a Palestinian woman, also pregnant. So the doctor and I figured out that the reason she probably lost the baby, we couldn't really explain why she would carry a dead baby all this time was that she was just so heartbroken over what had happened to her home. And, um, and so she was carrying up big bags of cement to rebuild the barn that you see in there. So my first piece of artwork when I came back in 2011 was this little collage. And I entered some contest. Um, it was sort of like you're given this small canvas and you have to kind of work on it. And so the whole story is actually here. And I started to sort of see the interconnections between Mother Mary weeping, the women from 1948 weeping, that women have always wept for the great tragedies that happened to them and to their children. 
And so this story broke my heart. Um, and uh, when I left, I said, I, I will try to come back. I had no idea if that was ever going to happen. And, and she said, um, you'll come for dinner. I said, well, that's Palestinian hospitality for you. You know, they always invite you for something. And I said, oh, great. She goes, no, you will cook with me in my new kitchen. Now, that's what they call samud. That's steadfastness. That she could imagine herself into a future where she would have a house again with a kitchen. And the highest honor a woman can give to another woman is say, come cook with me. Not to serve them, but to be together. So this is, um, I'm sharing this with you. This was one of my first collages. And I it knew nothing about making collage. I had no class in how to do this. But I just ripped paper. I decided I should not um, cut. That the world I had entered was being ripped apart. And, and so I should mirror that in the art I started to make. I was able to stay there um, because going in and out every three months, um, despite my age, uh, I was suspect. I was kept for four hours when I first went in as the mission personnel. I said, Peter, this is not going to work. I'm on some list. I see them looking at it. Maybe they've read my blog. Somebody's reading it. And he said, yeah. Uh, so I was put on a list to say I was not allowed to travel to the West Bank, which is where Bethlehem is and most of the people I would be working with. So I learned to sneak around, get on buses. But I said, I need a, a visa. And the only people who get visas are the clergy, and they get it through a church. So I learned about St. Andrew's Church of Scotland in Jerusalem. And I went and begged the minister there. I said, look, I'll do anything. I can preach, you know, just, I don't know, just just tell me. And, and just, you know, can I get the clergy visa? So I did. And that's why I was able to stay for five years. But I was always the clergyman. You see that there? Clergyman. I tried every year in different ways, even with women, for a feminist kind of thing. I said, you know, it's just clergy. We don't put man or woman, it's just clergy. Uh, and then, you know, if you put man, maybe somebody will think it's not me and then I'll have trouble. And then finally, one year, she said, you don't exist in our system. I said, yes, that's the issue, isn't it? So one day, I'll have a book and it'll be Clergyman in the Holy Land, and you'll know it's me. The YWCA has, at that time, two refugee camps. These camps came into existence in 48. So when the State of Israel was formed, um, there was a huge expulsion displacement of Palestinians, over 750,000. And they went to Lebanon, they went to Syria, to Jordan, and some stayed within the West Bank. The United Nations set up refugee camps for them. And UN Resolution 194 says that all refugees should return to their homes, their lands, as soon as possible. It was 1948. Not one single Palestinian has been allowed to return to their home. Not one. This is a UN resolution used by the State of Israel to welcome Jews from all over the world to the homeland of Israel. So you have Jews coming only because they're Jewish who are allowed to come to Israel and many to reclaim their homes. You have this huge disparity. Um, so why wanted me to figure out to do an advocacy project to lift up the right of return as essential for peacemaking? Because they served in these camps. Now, my former life, I was in the field of adult, adult education and literacy. And I had been an action researcher. I'd done oral histories things like this. So I said boldly, not speaking hardly any Arabic besides sabah haleh, sabah nur, you know, the regular things, to go into the homes of women in the refugee camps uh, who come from different parts of what had been historic Palestine and interview them about what had happened. I came up with 10 questions, had cute little um, a tape recorder, I had a translator, 
And I had seen this picture of this woman wearing her wedding dress from 1948. That's the only thing she took with her. And I was so moved by it in this tiny little story in just a few sentences sort of sketching out her life. And I thought I could do that with these women. So this was my model. The other model, which may be a bit odd, was the American Girl doll. You know those dolls, those expensive dolls? My daughter had Felicity from Williamsburg. She loved her. Um, uh, we did not buy the chair that cost $75. I said, honey, we're sitting in a chair that is, costs less than $75. Your doll's not going to have a chair. Anyway, but I realized why she loved her was she had history. And we read all about Williamsburg, and I thought, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to make dolls with the dresses from the villages that they were expelled from. And, and they will be beautiful. And people will know their story. And people who don't even know or maybe even care so much about what's going on there, they will be attracted by the beauty. They will come into this story through these women's lives. So I need a volunteer to come up and to be me, because we're going to do a reenactment of one of the stories. You don't have to do anything but stand here. It's nothing like weird, like you have to sing or something. Anybody? I just need one person. You just have to stand here. Come on. Oh, come. Yeah, it's fun. Well, yeah, fun. So, and you can just stand right here. So my first interview was with Miriam. Like I said, I was all prepared, all like kind of together about what I needed to do. Now look at Miriam's face. She's not a warm, fuzzy person. <laughs> and so I come in and she brings me. Now you're going to be me. And if you don't mind, I'm going to touch your face just a little bit. So you're me. And I'm like, do I shake hands? They often kiss on either side. I won't just this part. But Miriam like, went right to my lips and kissed me very hard. And I went, wow, this is different. Um, <laughs> And then she did this, and she just held me right like this for what seemed eternity. And I thought, I'm not really sure what's going on, but I'm being vetted. I think my soul is being looked at to see if I am worthy to hear her story. I figured that out. And then she goes like this, pushes me away. I'm like, okay, I guess we're good. Now, I'm still fiddling around with the tape recorder and where are my questions. We sit down and she just grabs my arm and she starts talking in Arabic as though I know Arabic. And I'm like, oh my God, there's no time to turn on the tape recorder. Um, I just need to listen to her. And I put the translator on the other side and I'm in the middle and everything is going into me, into this puddle of Arabic and English. And I'm praying to myself, God, help me remember the important parts, because this is not how I saw this happening, but this is how it's happening. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Miriam said. And you you can sit done. down. Yes, you're, you are for now, but so you have to sit there. So for this, I, I just have to become Miriam. I don't know how else to do this. The Haganah and the British came. We didn't have any time to take anything. So I grabbed the baby. You know, I was breastfeeding. I had a baby. And that's all I took, and of course the key, because they said we'd come back in two weeks. When we went outside, they started shooting at us. The British were shooting at us. I said, okay, remember that. The British were also shooting. And I was running down the road, and I see a mother just like me, and she has a baby just like me, and they shoot her. And the baby was sitting there, and the baby was sitting there, and the baby was sitting there. That's Miriam's story of 1948. She's crying now. I'm crying. The translator's crying. I don't know what I thought I was doing, to be honest, but I did not know I would hit so quickly the bedrock of suffering. I, I guess I thought I was going to hear some narrative, 
But that's the narrative of a breastfeeding woman who did not pick up a baby whose mother had just died. And she carries that pain deep inside of her. And I had the good sense to realize not to push further, that this was enough. So I was pretty shaken. And if you come up at the end, uh, we're going to do the goodbye. And I know the whole kissing thing now it could come right at me. So I'm like, you know, open but prepared. And she does that. Uh, first, she kisses me four times, which is a great compliment. Usually it's just two. And, and then she goes, in very good English, take it. Just like that. You sit down. Okay. I said, wow, okay, she speaks English. Um, the church commissioned me, as churches do when you go into the mission field, that Miriam anointed me. She anointed me for really the work that God sent me to do, which was slightly different from what the church sent me to do. I was sent to listen. I was sent to hear stories. I was sent to tell the stories when I got home and to do it on behalf of the Y and wherever I could go to give a sense of the tragedy of the Nakba, the great catastrophe that happened to Palestinians. So I realized, okay, forget the 10 questions. The main and only question is, what happened that day? Tell me what happened that day to you when you left your home. That was the only question needed. And women did the same thing with me that Miriam had done. Even though they saw the translator and all of that, I stopped bringing the tape recorder and they would just hold me and they would sit with me and tell me often a lot more than Miriam did. I did go back to Miriam another time to film her and she had on this beautiful dress with red thread and I complimented her because embroidery is very special to women. And she said she hadn't worn it in 25 years. And I said, 25 years? I mean, that's a really long time not to wear a dress. She said, there's been nothing to celebrate. And us doing the film and have, hearing her life was a celebration. So I wrote a short story called The Resistance of Red Thread. Because one of the ways Palestinian women resist is this. They make beauty, even when things are really awful. And often, when the Palestinian flag could not be flown, they would make their dresses with the colors of the flag, and sometimes little tiny flags. Um, and that was how they maintained their sanity and their resistance. So she's wearing that dress here in the picture, Miriam. I'm going to stay here one more time. A couple months later, uh, some of uh, the leaders of the YWCA came from Geneva. They wanted to see our work. They asked me to take to Miriam's house in the refugee camp in Jalasun. And so and I'm really ready for the, the, the kiss now. I'm like, OK, come at it. I'm, I'm good. I'm here. Uh, and she and I have this thing. We just have this connection. And she never told the story of the baby ever again. It was only that one time. But she, she told about other tragedies. In the middle of doing this, we get a call that a child has been shot uh, at the playground, a settler, or maybe it was uh, um, one of the police. And we needed to get out of there before all hell broke loose, basically. And I watched the past of the Nakba turn into the Nakba of the present. Do you understand what I mean? The tragedy of 48 was here again and the violence committed against children. And I watched her tears of the past mingle the tears of the present. And so when we said goodbye, she not only kissed me, she bit into my lip. There was actually a little bit of blood. And she just held me. I thought, she's never going to let me go. I am holding her pain. She's just kind of done an infusion of the pain of the past and what just happened. And so we left in time. We weren't caught in some horrible violence. The kids were all getting ready with their slingshots, with their rocks, and their marbles. That's what they have. And I realized in talking to a Palestinian friend of mine later, I asked about this kiss. I said, she drew blood. He goes, oh my god, you've got the grandmother's kiss. I said, this is done? He said, oh, yeah. 
she must really like you. I said, really? She said, yeah. She gave you her pain to share. So this is why Miriam is very special to me. This is her. And I had the pleasure <laughs> later to bring a doll to each woman I interviewed wearing the dress. This is from Beit Nabala, which is near Jaffa, and this is the citrus fruits, and it's white. A lot of people buy her. By the way, all these dolls are available through UCC resources, and they all come with little bits of their story and a, a lovely booklet. So I went around and I basically did the same thing, but nothing was quite as powerful as Miriam. And I'm going to move to my own artwork. Um, and so that's what I did when some people say, oh, you're so political. Didn't you do anything like holy there? And I said, I lived under a military occupation just like Jesus. It was pretty uh, holy. You know, I understand him a lot better having lived there. Um, and, and I got to, you know, make dolls. So that was always my defense. I made doll clothes. You know, how innocent is that? And they go, hmm. I said, well, I didn't make them. I worked with women who embroidered and I designed them. Um, but um, so this has been a wildly successful project. Um, people buy one doll, they buy two dolls. Uh, one year, a young man who came from Brooklyn who was Jewish, who was helping to plant olive trees, Ben, bought all the dolls. And I said, Ben, what are you doing with these dolls? He said, I'm going to give them to my family. We don't talk about this part of the history. I'm going to give one to my grandmother, my mother, my sister. We're going to sit down at dinner and I'm going to introduce the Nakba to them through the dolls. Wow. Okay. So from the success of this, we had some leftover dolls, uh, the molds. They're beautiful olive wood. And I convinced the why who are mostly Orthodox Christians, so this was not an easy thing. I said, you know, we ministers say the wise ones came at Christmas. They weren't just men. Mm, that's not what it says in our Bible. <laughs> I said, well, it's translated into men because you know how patriarchy is. It's always men. But there were wise ones, and that included women. We are the only ones ever to have made the wise women, and they're over there wearing beautiful Syrian silk gowns with little rhinestones, very happy about them. And they come with a little booklet with a beautiful poem by Jan L. Richardson about the wise ones coming. And you know there are a lot of jokes on this, right? The women got there on time, you know, they brought casseroles and diapers, they met the other women who were the probably the midwives, so, so you can buy also the wise women. And then because of the wall that was still there, uh, we had some olive workers make five slabs of, uh, of olive wood to be the wall. And you might go, why five? Because when I had come back in 2011, I had made the, um, the olive, I had used the wall to knock down for Advent. So how we light candles, I was knocking down the wall. And my boss at the Y thought, that's a great idea. So there's a little booklet there that goes with the wall, and it's you can take it apart, and you can knock it down, and you can read a little prayer every time you knock it down, either for Advent or Lent. And, uh, and then I took pictures of the designs on the wall, and they made them into stickers. So a lot of people love the stickers. Don't we all love stickers still? And so they would buy this. And a lot of Israeli activists bought the wall. And I said, what are you doing with this? They said, we never see what's on the other side. We only see this fake garden painted on our side. We don't know all the resistance and protest art on the other side. So those are some of the projects that I did with the Y. I just want to mention them all. And the last is the refugee family the Holy Family escaping into Egypt to remind uh, everyone that our sacred story tells us uh, how we are to treat refugees. So as I always say and others say, Jesus is not only our refuge, but Jesus was a refugee. You know, and that's, I see refugees welcome. They welcome because it's part of our text. 
So this is my studio outside. Um, it's very therapeutic to smash things. And people started bringing me things to smash uh, or fix. And, and so I spent a lot of time in my little garden uh, doing this. And I started making things. Uh, this was the Lord's Prayer plate that had broken. I stuck a mirror in between. It's covered with bullets and marbles and tear gas canisters. At that point, there was a lot of violence going on in the streets, and so now I was picking things up from the street, uh, mostly the bullets. Those big black ones are sponge bullets, which are said not to kill people, but if you're very close or you hit an eight-year-old in their heart, they will die. And the rubber-coated bullets are on the table here, and I invite you afterwards to go feel it. Rubber-coated steel bullets. They're still steel, and they can kill you. Um, and so I collected all of this stuff. People also gave them to me. And during the exhibit in Bethlehem, this fell off the wall and smashed all over the ground. Everyone thought it was a performance piece, like I had done that on purpose. I'm like, no, it just fell off the wall. But I thought, I'm from the UCC. God is still speaking. God is still breaking open. So I said, okay, here's the glue. We're gonna glue it back. Don't try to put it back like it's normal. It's not, but we will create something new. So now it looks quite different. This is Mary. Uh, uh, she's an icon on the Bethlehem wall. And for some reason, I was able to get behind this barbed wire to see that she was imprisoned. And uh, sh this is surrounded by a window frame from a demolished home. So I would go to demolished uh, demolitions and pick up pieces and work with those. These are floor tiles from the Jaffa Beach. It's called Beach 48 because they are the remnants of homes from 1948. And I was fascinated by them. I just loved the way they looked. And I made a piece that looks like this. So it was a broken window. And let's see. Uh-oh. And I, uh, not a window, uh, a mirror. So the poem wraps around looking like the sea, and sometimes I'd put a piece of blue cloth on the other side to get it. I wanted to capture what I thought these tiles were speaking about, and then there are a bunch of them on the table. I made, made little cards, you know, like if you go hiking, you see these little stones piled up, and they tell you which way to go. And I, I thought, there will not be peace with justice until the past is reconciled. And so I made these little things. Everyone in the office loved it. They all wanted them. I became quite popular simply gluing these tiles together. Um, but this is the poem that I'd like to share with you. It's called All That Remains. So much depends upon these broken floor tiles smashed against the rocks, geometric patterns of brown and black, green and mustard, splashes of red and baby blue. <coughs> One has a heart. Like a cross between an archaeologist and a bag lady, I scour the beach collecting them, throwing away the ones too big to carry, too worn. Like a talisman, each tells a story of lives lived, and salons or kitchens, bedrooms or baths, making love and iftar dinners, praying and children tickling each other. Like a key to a door they would rather keep locked, or covered up in a dumpster of made-up history of what never happened to a people, living their lives by this majestic blue-green-gray sea, eating warm taboon bread with olive oil and fresh labne, oranges from your grove. These thick sea-washed tiles are all that remains of lives I will never know, but whose stories I must imagine and make beautiful again. So I hope you see, which I don't think I saw at the time, the thread, that Miriam had anointed me to listen to stories, and it wasn't just people's stories, it was the things that I found and that were just cast aside um, that were like this. 
And that's what it looks like close up. And then I did Broken Jerusalem. And there was an Armenian potter who had this in his shop with his leftover shards. And I thought, I can do that. And he showed me how to do it, what kind of glue. John Dowhower, the president of the United Church of Christ, when he first came to visit me, he asked, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm okay. He said, how do you take care of yourself? I said, I smash things. He goes, mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I make things after I smash them, and I make art. He goes, really, could I have a piece? No, I'm not really an artist, right? I'm just making stuff. And I go back to my place, and I see broken Jerusalem. And it has blood on it because I cut myself. And I thought, I can't give him a piece with blood on it. Well, maybe I can. And there's blood on the streets. I, I could make up a story about why it's on there besides the fact that I hurt myself. So John Dowhower, if you ever go to his office in the United Church of Christ, my art piece is hanging on his wall. When I saw it there a couple of years later, he said, I love it. And I really like the blood part. And <laughs> yeah, so this is the second one I made. It reflects how I felt. Everything was a mess and broken. Um, and then I started putting that little evil eye protection thing that you see all in the Middle East, started adding that as a kind of tribute. This is on the table here. This is on a toilet lid. Now, my friends started to wonder, because I was now going into the dumpsters and looking for things. And I, my, I had a rule that I would work mostly with things I found. And, and there were lots of interesting things. I didn't crawl in, you know, I just looked at the top. And this toilet that was perfect, it looked like a shield. You know, if you look at your toilet now, you, you'll see it looks like a shield, has two little hooks, perfect for hanging, and for putting um, broken pottery on. This is a tribute to the Church of Loaves and Fishes that was burned in an attack by settlers. Uh, very um, orthodox, very conservative people do not like Christians, they think we're pagans because we have the Trinity uh, amongst things. And so they attacked the loaves and fishes and it was burned for a very long time. And you, I don't know what year you were there, Michael, but you could go years later, they hadn't, you could still smell it charred. I thought, how in the world is that possible? So my Jewish friend who is a, a very uh, well-known journalist, I said, Richard, what should I be focusing on? He said, tell the story of the Christians there. People don't know they're there, and they don't know they're being persecuted. He said, that's your work. I said, okay. <laughs> so I did. So during the Gaza war, there's been so many. It's not a war. Offense. Offensive. That's what the um, Palestinians call it. Because it's very asymmetrical. The Hamas has a few uh, missiles, and Israel has like lots of bombs. Um, many of them uh, helped to, uh, to be created by money from our military aid. And I'm very well aware since I've returned that when you hear the news, it always starts with Hamas missiles, as though that was the cause. Not that um, Palestinian fishermen who are out fishing well within their limits were killed while fishing, or various other things. So just a few words that you probably know already. It's an illegal siege. Um, as much, whatever we may think about Hamas government, they were democratically elected. But most important under international law, under an occupation, the occupier does not have the right to self-defense with those they occupy. In fact, the occupied are perfectly allowed under the Geneva Conventions to use force back. So it's the absolute opposite of what we hear. So when I did action alerts for the YWCA during that summer, I started each week with Israel does not have the right to self-defense. And finally, the director, the Y, Mira, said, why do you always start that way? Because so I said, I'm doing the opposite of CNN. Because once you hear that, that they have the right to self-defense, anything is then possible. But it's not actually accurate under international law. So I had a folder in my computer, still do, on babies, babies who have died. 
they, these terrible things have happened to children. My daughter thinks this is a sign of some kind of sickness, but it helped me to just kind of keep track. In the center there, the baby uh, was part of a family that was burned in Duma. And um, this was Ali. He was the sole survivor of that burning. His parents died. His brother died. And I became very attached to this child. And, you know, he's now grown up. I've watched him grow up through Facebook posts. I was very um, upset by that. There's little Alain down there. You see in the bottom? Uh, he was that little toddler that was on the beach that the world just woke up to what was happening to refugees when they saw him. And the baby on the left is baby Shema. Baby Shema uh, was killed in Palestine, and this is the poem I wrote. It was a turning point for me. I can live on bread alone, fragments of hope, tea lights in a dark cave. Baby Shema, born from her dead mother, was my miracle baby. She was my sign that death doesn't win, that resurrection is still possible. So when she died in her state-of-the-art donated incubator, because her oxygen was cut off, because they bombed the last power plant, I lost it. I let my faith go, like a kite without a string. I let myself sink into a heap of blown-up body parts of children, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts. I couldn't breathe. I allowed myself to sob, to rock and keen, to become her mother. I allowed myself to curse and finally to sing her a lullaby while I pulled out her tubes so I could hug her one more time. I allowed myself to touch the horror of it all. I didn't often allow myself. You can't. You can't live in such a place and feel every single pain. So it's a collage, and I took gauze, and it covered up the baby, and I covered up little Shema, and I had a little piece of cloth left, and I covered the white in my collar, and that's when I fell apart, that I am this close to the situation I'm in. And I told myself my own rule when it was time to leave was if I became numb, not if I would fall apart from the pain, but if I couldn't feel anymore because I thought this was normal, then you should send me home because I'm no good to you anymore. So this is uh, a beautiful piece inside a Syrian frame that I was given. So I was becoming this kind of weird, not a celebrity, but maybe just the odd woman who makes things. And somebody left this on my doorstep. And I thought, this picture of these children belong here from a Syrian artist that I don't know, and given by someone who just decided to gift me with this beautiful frame. This is the piece of a window, and down below are the women I interviewed. And then because my daughter says, Mom, you're, you're like an artistic hoarder. I said, I am not. I, you know, I collect things, it's different. <laughs> And she said, everything is always over the top. Well, I suppose, look at this, you know. I said, no, I can do simple things. So there's a simple little camel all by himself in the desert. And I said, see, I can do that. <laughs> there he is, right? Very lovely camel. But of course, I like this better. Um, those are the women I interviewed. And you can see me sitting really close. And I was really stunned when Michael chose that middle picture to put on the flyer because it's just lived in this art piece mostly. But it is, um, it is how I listened. I closed my eyes and I just prayed that I would remember what I was supposed to remember. And we'll never know what I didn't remember. Um, and the red thread you can see in it is weaving things together. Then I decided I don't play chess. I was dating an ambassador who did play chess. I was terrible. He said, you need to play three moves ahead. I said, three? I can't even remember what the bishop can do. What do you mean three moves ahead? So he said, no, I'll teach you. I said, okay. 
but can we play with my set? He goes, you have your own set? I said, yes, it's Israel versus Palestine. I'll be Palestine, you be Israel. Um, and so we played, and I got to win. And he goes, you know Palestine's not winning, right? And I said, well, you know, in the chess game. So those are little toy soldiers, those are rocks. And then I got more sophisticated. And I got prayer beads, and I, I had the... The, um, the, I had the big tiles uh, for the uh, Palestinians, and they still have pawns that are rocks. Uh, Israel is very loaded up. They have canisters, tear gas canisters, sponge bullets, and rubber-coated bullets. And, and then one time when Sweden um, allowed, or, or not allowed, the uh, Palestinian uh, Authority could have uh, an embassy in Stockholm. It was a pretty big thing. This was really recognizing the state of Palestine. He said, I need to teach you gambits. I said, I can barely play, but okay. And so he would show me, you know, a gambit where you're kind of stuck. And he would say, it's a big move what Sweden did, but it's not winning. And so we would make gambits and different things, and then I would write about it. And then he said, you don't really want to learn chess, do you? I said, just enough <laughs> so I can make pictures and talk about it. But thank you. So we would play with these little characters. And then I had a lot of these sponge bullets, and I uh, was fooling around with making crosses. And so there's a piece on the table um, where I took these sponge bullets and basically put them on a canvas, and I called it um, caught in the crosshairs. And sometimes I just did little reenactments when I was kind of depressed and it just seemed like a mess. I would just throw everything in a pile and take a picture and say, this is really what's going on here. It's just one hot mess. Um, and, and then I would write about that. Sometimes I wrote, sometimes I did the art. When I came back and I was evaluated by the um, the uh, psychology guy who's to make sure that you're okay. You didn't get irreparably damaged during your time in the field. I told him about my artwork and I showed it to him online and he goes, this saved you. I said, what? He says, because you externalized all this pain. What I look for are the return missionaries who didn't do this and it's all in them living inside there. And he said, I can't speak to whether it's art, but clearly this helped you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Beit Shemal uh, Monastery. It was vandalized, as it had been many times, but never inside the fourth century sanctuary. Again, a lot of Christians are seen as pagans because we believe in the Trinity. They came in and they knocked out the faces of all the people in the stained glass windows. Not the whole window, just the faces. I thought, wow, they had a lot of time in here to be so careful. And they knocked over the statue of the Virgin Mary, and it was a tipping point for me. I don't know why, but it was. And so I reread the Magnificat, and about her call for the world to be a different order, and her little head on the floor staring at me still spoke. And I took the charge that we are to become her vessels of this reversal. And that's our call as Christians in particular. And so I promised the nuns at Beit Shemal, they gave me their broken pottery, I would make something, I would say something and send it back to them. I think they probably thought it was a bit crazy that I did this, but I, I did give it to them. But the artwork I have, and it looks like a stained glass window and has a lot of gold leaf in it. And this was the end of that prayer. Pray for us all, Mother of our Redeemer, mirror of justice, for your world yet to be born. Eye to eye now, charge us to be your vessels, your promised threat. So it's called the threat of Mary's promise, that Magnificat. Now, Michael referred to me, I forget, a force of, what did you say? Force of nature, five minutes. Um, I got a fatwa against me, a very bizarre fatwa from a Zionist organization off the coast of Jerba. But nonetheless, with a fatwa, it had things like, you know, FBI wants you, we're going to kill you, and it was a bit scary. 
And, and so I um, went, okay, uh, do I stop talking, writing? Uh, why did I come here if I do that? I'm a bit scared. So I did what we tell people to do, come to the foot of the cross, and I did. And I wrote about it. And I came to the conclusion that if I left, then I didn't trust God. God had sent me here, and I need to stay here. And so this was the piece uh, that I wrote towards that. And we're coming to the end. I'd made vestments. Uh, I didn't sew. Let me recalc say that. I designed vestments with the women in Beit Jala, and, and this was one of them. It's quite beautiful, very fancy. They put a giant cross on the back. They were cute. They said, do you ever turn around? I said, of course I do. You know, I don't just walk like this. And I look like a pope with a big cross in the back. And then I made a stole. They made the stole. I designed the stole. I made Christmas ornaments out of tear gas canisters. I decorated sound bombs for my outdoor Christmas tree. I'm going to end with this. So um, this is a Mahmoud Darwish poem, and it's about hope. And this is where I'd like to leave you tonight and then have some questions. Hope on the slope of hills, facing the dusk and the canon of time, close to the gardens of broken shadows. We do what the prisoners do and what the jobless do. We cultivate hope. In God's garden of broken shadows, facing night and canons of time, we are commanded to cultivate hope. How? How do we dare speak of hope when all around us are signs of dispossession, destruction, and continued catastrophes? God's creation is groaning under the weight of settler colonialism and a belligerent military occupation in the land between the sea and the river that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all call holy. How do we speak of hope when each day records new human rights violations, a new family made homeless, a school demolished, a nonviolent activist imprisoned, a village disappeared? On earth as it is in heaven? Not yet. Is it still possible? Was it ever? St. Augustine said, hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to make sure they do not stay that way. He saw hope as a mother who gives life and mourns when that life is threatened or violated. Her daughters are righteous rage and courage to stand where God stands or where Jesus leads. To cultivate hope, then, we must adopt hope's daughters as our own. So this is how we cultivate hope. We go to the places of suffering and struggle, to the garden of broken shadows. We stand where God stands, and we join God's mission for another world. We become gardeners in that garden of abundant life and broken shadows. Thank you very much. Thank you.